So to step back so far, what I've told you about really are three key areas of cytoplasmic mRNA function. Localization of the mRNA, translation, and degradation. And these three processes are coupled with the general rules that you don't translate until you're localized, and you stop translation before you degrade. They may be coupled even more mechanistically because a similar group of proteins, which is involved in translational repression and decapping, is involved in coupling these processes of translation and degradation. So then, an important question then is to try to understand how the fates of different mRNAs uh, are controlled uh, to give different types of localization, different types of translation, and different rates of degradation. And at the simplest level, we can think about this as really how the mRNA interacts with these different machines in the cell. That is, the localization is going to be dictated by how the mRNA and the proteins associated with, with it interact with motors and anchors in the cell. How well it the mRNA translates is going to be influenced by how well it interacts with translation factors, either directly or indirectly. And how well it degrades uh, is going to be influenced by its interaction with the degradation machinery. So an important principle to understand then is how do mRNAs interact with these different machines and how is that different between different messages? First, to highlight something we've already talked about, there are intrinsic differences between different mRNAs. Uh, so we've already talked about how with translation, uh, some mRNAs can have irises, which allows them to interact directly with the translation machinery, bypassing the need for certain translation initiation factors. Similarly, there are examples where RNAs interact directly with the RNA decay machinery and therefore influence their fate. For example, in mammalian cells, the RRP41 mRNA has a high affinity binding site for the DCP2 protein. This is the decapping enzyme. And so the presence of that sequence leads to this mRNA being rapidly degraded. So these are intrinsic differences with how they interact with the cytoplasmic machinery. Then we also have layered on top of that again sequence-specific RNA binding proteins and how they interact with these machineries as well. So I just want to give two examples of this. So in mammalian cells, there's a protein called uh, HUD. It's an RNA binding protein that binds to these ARE elements again. And once it does, it also has a region which can bind to the, uh, uh, one of the initiation factors uh, in the cap binding complex and therefore promote uh, faster rates of translation initiation. Okay. So an RNA specific, specific binding protein binding to the message recruiting the translation machinery. We see the exact same process with RNA degradation. Here's an RNA binding protein, uh, MBT5, which binds to certain mRNAs in yeast cells, and then has direct interactions with components of this CCR4 uh, deadenylase complex. So the presence of this protein recruits the nuclease to the message and leads to much faster rates of deadenylation. So direct interactions between RNA binding proteins and either translation machinery or uh, mRNA degradation machinery. And we might ask, how much of this kinds of uh, regulation should we expect? And we should expect a lot of it. If we look in the yeast, in the genomes of organisms, there's a tremendous number of RNA binding proteins. The initial drafts of the human genome predicted greater than 1,000 RNA binding proteins. And this is probably an underestimate because we know that many proteins bind RNA which don't have sequence motifs which allow them to be identified as RNA binding proteins. Similarly, the yeast genome, uh, has greater than 600 RNA binding proteins. 